Welcome everyone, this is 5 dark and disturbing revenge stories from the r slash nuclear revenge subreddit, including one that is about a well-documented murder case from the 90s about a woman butchering her husband. Let's read. Vigilante Justice on Serial Rapist, 1959. Alright, I seriously debated posting this, but I have decided to share it. So when I got out of the Navy in 1958, like many young men, I joined a fraternity. Now most of the brothers were nice people, except this a-hole we'll call Brad. Brad was a four-time legacy from our fraternity. At first, he seemed nice, but after he became a fully initiated member, he let his inner jerk show. He was such a butt because he would always show off with daddy's money. He was 18 and never had a job. He always got super drunk at the parties and got handsy with other people's girlfriends. Now his dad was a political figure in Sacramento, and his mother's father worked in the California system of higher education. Brad knew that he was untouchable and wasn't afraid to let you know. Brad in 1959 crashed three cars because he drove drunk. His parents bought a new Cadillac each time because he claimed someone stole and crashed his. When his parents bought him a Buick convertible, he said that he has a reputation to uphold and doesn't want people to think that he is poor. A couple of months into the fall semester and Brad is drunkenly harassing women at the party, even saying lewd and suggestive things to them. We try to cut him off, but he keeps going on. Some of us go and leave Brad to himself. Hours later, we see a girl leaving Brad's room. I'm thinking in my head, she doesn't want to be seen taking the walk of shame. She just cries while covering her face and holding her shoes. I knock on Brad's door and he says, Ready for round two? Get your butt on the bed. When he sees that it's me, he puts his clothes on. I ask why that girl was crying and he said, How the F should I know? But she was blonde, tan, tight. I ignored him, but I tell the other brother what happened. They know that he is a pig and just brushed it off. A couple of days later, police came to our house and arrested Brad for rape. Apparently, they were watching him because 13 other girls were accusing him. Now, Brad had this birthmark on his private parts, so the statements from the girls were taken into account and he was arrested. The evidence was undeniable, especially with the details that the girls were giving regarding Brad. Due to him being a sexual predator, he was expelled from the chapter, without him knowing that's important later. So we and one of the sororities on campus started a support group for the victims. Girl 1 was saying how Brad made her feel and that she wanted to get back at him. Girl 2 was talking about if she had the chance, she would kick his butt. So one of our brothers, who we'll call Ralph, said, Well, why don't you? What? The girls responded. When he comes back to our house, we can take him somewhere and you can have some time with him. In the desert. Alone, replied Ralph. So mere days after Brad was arrested, he was bailed out with the help of mommy and daddy, and he came back to the house. We started lying, saying how we know that the charges were BS. He said, yeah, my dad has a whole team of lawyers representing me. This is going to go away fast. So Brad gets drunk, but Ralph roofied him. Ralph and some of the other guys proceed to drive three hours east from the coast into the California desert. Ralph and some of the other guys meet nine of the 13 girls in the desert. They wake up Brad, who is still somewhat drunk, and pushed him out of the car. Now, as Brad wakes up, I was told that he went pale face as he saw the women that he victimized were standing over him with blunt objects, stabbing weapons, and a shovel. Brad cries out to Ralph and the other guys. You can't leave me here alone, Brad says sniffling. You aren't alone. You have plenty of company and you know everybody here, said Ralph. The guys drove off and the girls came back to campus three hours later with dirt on their clothes and a red stained potato sack. Us guys never knew what became of Brad, but to this day when we see the remaining girls that are living, we never ask. Thanks for reading. Best college guest speaker ever. When finishing up my degree in criminal justice, we had to learn about how the justice system works and how sometimes it doesn't. For about two weeks, we studied a case from the early 90s of a woman that had killed her husband. Because the case is public record and a very interesting read, look up Betty Freeberg, 1993. The setting was small town Iowa and the husband was the town drunk. Everyone in town knew him for a drunk, a brawler, a womanizer, and overall just a bad person. His wife was the stay-at-home mom as she wasn't allowed to work or leave the house aside from getting groceries. He would go home, beat her, and violate her, and the cycle would go on and on, and the whole town knew. Neighbors were a quarter mile down the road, but still would call the police when they heard noises. It was well documented, and because he was never a threat to their daughter, the police did nothing aside from take him to jail like a revolving door. Each time he got out, he'd beat her up again. Their daughter was away at college, but came home for Thanksgiving. While the father was at work, the daughter told the mother that her father had violated her, and that she even had an abortion because of it. 
This was the breaking point for the mother. She got her revenge 100-fold. When daughter went back to school after the holidays and husband came home, she killed him with his gun at the kitchen table. The table is important because it was a big farm table used for chopping up deer and other livestock. Doing the butchering was her job, and she was good at it. If I could find the case report, it has pictures of the table and clear marks of chopping. She chopped up her husband and scattered his body over neighboring farms, fed what she could to her livestock, and cleaned up. Months went by and winter came and left. Police investigating his disappearance even questioned her while sitting at the table drinking coffee. She explained the marks on the table by explaining that she butchered her own meat and showed the officers her deep freeze. The investigation went on for months until finally a neighbor's dog brought back a body part. They identified it as belonging to him and she was arrested on the spot. She pled not guilty and refused any offers. It went to trial and 12 of her peers judged her not guilty due to extenuating circumstances. She confessed to the crime, explained why she did it and how, and that she had no real choice because no one was going to help her. The farm was hers and she refused to give it up as it had been her family's home. She was let go entirely for the murder charge. The next week, we had Betty as a speaker to the class to discuss the case and she was awesome. At the time, she ironically sold dismemberment insurance for Aflac. Betty, if you ever read this, know you're seen as a figurehead for battered women and you pulled off the best revenge I have ever been able to study. Now this one is extremely interesting because like OP said, it's a well-documented case. Betty Freeberg, 1993. Not only did this woman walk free, as she should, she's also able to be completely public about this and do guest speaking at colleges. Now how many killers throughout history, justified or not, get to go on and do public speaking about it? This wasn't just revenge, she was protecting herself and her daughter. This woman is awesome. Methanol Vodka this is a story about someone my parents knew in the Soviet Union. First, some context. In Russia, people have a main home and a secondary home for the summer, called a dacha. Now, when you lived in your main home, 99% of the time, people broke into the dacha and vandalized or stole things. This guy was tired of people breaking in, and he worked in a government chemical facility. So on the last day of summer, he brought to his dacha some methanol and poured it in some empty vodka bottles. Then he left the bottles on the table. When he came back next summer, he returned to three corpses. Here's the revenge part. Generally, this is first and second degree murder, but since they broke in and drank it, he's not liable. It's the same thing to breaking into someone's home and stabbing yourself with a kitchen knife. So he walked away free. Entitled engineer makes a mistake he will regret for the rest of his life. This is a story that I thankfully didn't witness, but my coworker did. An engineer relocated with his wife to a small town while he supervised a local engineering project. He had three daughters who lived in the neighboring city and would visit him constantly. While he wasn't exactly rich, he was considerably wealthier than the average habitant of this little town. This made him and his wife extremely entitled. He would do as he pleased and then bribe the police to avoid repercussions. He made himself infamous for cheating on his wife constantly. One day, he laid his eyes on a local 18-year-old girl. The girl didn't like him back, so she rejected him. One day, he got drunk and ripped the poor girl. He hurt her so bad, the girl was left in a wheelchair for life. The girl's father tried to bring him to justice, but the engineer used whatever money he had to bribe the police. What not many people knew is that the girl's uncle was a local drug lord. The father and the uncle hadn't spoken for years, and the girl hadn't even met her uncle. But when the drug lord learned what happened to his niece, he decided he would have his revenge. A few weeks later, my coworker was working as a gardener for the engineer, when the cries of young women caught everyone's attention. Outside the engineer's house were the drug lord's men who had captured the engineer's daughters. In front of the engineer and his wife, the men used machetes to cut the daughter's legs. There was blood everywhere, but the worst was the cries of the three women. They were rushed to the hospital, but two of them bled to death on the way, while the third one was left obviously wheelchair-bound for life. While my coworker has since left this town, he says people told him the engineer's wife hasn't said a single word since that day. OP goes on to add a bit of context for this story and says, People have asked me for news coverage of this event. This story happened during the opening years of the war on drugs in northwestern Mexico, a time where both the government and the drug lords, they are usually the same people by the way, did everything within their power to keep news like this from being published. This is a good example of how revenge isn't always pretty. Sometimes revenge is acted out by very immoral people, and in this case, this person targeted their innocent family members that had nothing to do with the situation in the first place. Abusive husband loses his family, house, visa, dignity, and $100,000. 
This story happened in Lebanon, Australia, Lebanon, in that order, so please bear with me. My cousin is Australian and has just met a wonderful person. He cared for her, loved her, and really treated her in a special caring way. Or so we thought. One day she came in the middle of the night to my house and then I saw her with her son. Both had bruises on their face. As it turns out, he just married her for her privileges as an Australian. So when they got a son, she got pressured to handle the abuse and stay with him just so that she can see her son. And now this guy is gonna pay. My family and I devised an elaborate plan to send the cousin and her son to Australia, where she has more custody rights over there, but we also had to help her get some money to start her business there as well. First, we went to the police, who said they can't arrest him because the cousin didn't report him, but they mind us taking care of him. So later that night, one of my cousins and I attacked him with bars of soap wrapped in a towel, no bruises or wounds, and we beat him until they broke. And afterwards, he went to the police station to report us, and they just laughed at him. After he got out, we warned him to leave Lebanon before we seriously hurt him. And after that confrontation, he got his wife, son, and $100,000. Here came the tricky part. We had to have incriminating evidence of his abuse to blackmail him. We can't attack him in Australia. So after my aunt helped them get a house, she rigged a camera, and after she captured the abuse and timed the recordings, my cousin took her son and the $100,000. When the guy tried to confront her and take his son and money back to Lebanon, he was shown the incriminating footage and given an ultimatum. He either leaves Australia without divorcing the wife with the son and he might get killed, or he leaves Australia penniless, and he chose the latter. When he made it back to Lebanon, he slipped into alcoholism. He lost his house due to his temper issues, lost his visa since his ex-wife reported him anyway, and is currently a homeless man. I saw him while I was in the car in Lebanon, I'm currently stuck there, and he looked so empty. Even when he saw me and recognized me, he didn't react. And then I realized that I made him lose everything. Even his Australian visa got revoked. But then you realize that this man deserved it. My cousin is currently running a restaurant with her new husband, who has a daughter, and is a truly amazing guy. And that was our slash nuclear revenge. This was a glimpse into the darker side of humanity, and if you enjoyed this, feel free to drop a like and subscribe if you want to see more. Thanks for watching everyone, stay safe out there.